Anyone who's ever called a doctor's office or insurance company knows there is no more convoluted, inefficient system in the United States than healthcare. Hello, and thank you for calling Cigna. Calls may be monitored or recorded to ensure quality of service. That's no coincidence. The government has been intervening for more than a century. People often justify government interventions in healthcare by saying that we have a right to healthcare. We do have rights to healthcare, and our most important healthcare right is the right to make our own health decisions. For most decisions, we get to shop around, sample, compare prices, find reviews on relatively unimportant things like brands of peanut butter. The markets for those things have as little friction as possible between customers and businesses. But look at the market for the most important decisions we'll ever make which doctor to see, which emergency procedure to have. It can be a struggle just to speak to a real person. And if you ever do, they can't even tell you what that visit or procedure will cost. How did what should be a simple exchange of money for services end up looking like this? And what can we do about it? My name is Michael Cannon. I'm the director of health policy studies at the Cato Institute in Washington, DC. The original sin of US health policy was when in the early 1900s, government decided it would start licensing doctors and other clinicians, telling them you need to get permission from the government in order to practice medicine. It made becoming a doctor more expensive, which made healthcare more expensive. Licensing has also reduced the quality of care. You know, one of the ways it did so in the United States was by it ended up blocking Jews and women and African Americans from practicing medicine. In 1913, another bull in a China shop was unleashed on what had been a rapidly improving healthcare system when the federal government instituted the income tax. They did not know how to tax the health benefits that employers were providing to their workers as income. It created a situation where either you let your employer control a significant chunk of your income, or if you took that money as cash and bought your own health insurance, the government would penalize you with higher taxes. And if you thought that was bad, just you wait. Please stay on the line and our next available representative will assist you. As bombs were dropping throughout Europe during World War II, facing a national scarcity of labor, Congress dropped perhaps the most socialist act in U.S. history. The Stabilization Act of 1942 froze wages to prevent companies from offering higher salaries to attract new workers. What happened? What always happens when new laws are passed? The most cunning companies looked for a loophole. Guess where they found it? Healthcare. To attract workers without offering higher wages, companies added to their lineup of health benefits. It drove employers further into the insurance game and further distorted the market for health insurance. People end up demanding more insurance, both because the after-tax price is lower and because it seems like it's their employer's money they're spending when it's really actually their own. Sure enough, by 2020, employment-based insurance covered 54% of the American population. All right, if insurance is heavily tied to employment, which group of people, a group of people that really needs health insurance, gets screwed? Remember, anyone who doesn't get health insurance through their employer gets penalized in taxes. I've got plenty of time to wait, but I'm sure you're busy, so let's send it back to Michael. So, about 50 years after the government put that penalty in place, it looked around and saw there are all sorts of retirees who, who had no health insurance. And it also noticed that health care is so expensive, those retirees can't afford it on their own. The government created these problems, but rather than undo the things that created those problems, government said, you know what, we're going to double down. We are going to create a Medicare program to provide health care, health insurance to seniors who lost it because we tied insurance to employment. We're going to create a Medicaid program to provide health care for the poor who can't afford it because we've done so much to make health care more expensive. Americans would soon find out that Medicare often overcovers routine care but stops covering you if you get really sick, while Medicaid patients have found it even more difficult to get appointments with doctors. The Medicare program basically says to enrollees and doctors, whatever you two want, we will pay for it. Medicare imposes almost no limits 
on how much doctors and hospitals can charge the Medicare program. The Medicaid program is very similar. The two programs have continued to grow in scope, cost, and in efficiency. Also growing, their wait times. Between 1965 and 2010, there were some smaller shakeups in the industry. COBRA in 1986 allowed employees who lose their jobs to continue with their health plans for 18 months. In the early 90s, President Bill Clinton put Hillary in charge of promoting the Health Security Act, which would have required virtually all Americans to enroll in a health care policy. It died in Congress because this individual mandate was considered too radical. As a fairly young person, proud millennial here, when I think of health care, I think Obamacare. It was passed in 2010, and it was a huge deal. Obamacare tried to cover all of those people that the government threw out of their health insurance by favoring employer-sponsored health insurance. We don't care if someone is healthy. We don't care if they're sick. You have to provide everyone with health insurance, regardless of pre-existing conditions. This created a huge problem because in order for insurance companies to do that, they had to dramatically increase premiums for young and healthy people. How did the government decide to solve this problem? Well, it decided to solve this problem by requiring, forcing those young and healthy people to buy insurance through something we call an individual mandate. Yep, that same individual mandate that was considered too radical less than 20 years earlier. And yep, we've reached the end of the video and I'm still on hold. It's a good thing I wasn't calling because say my appendix burst and I needed to know right away which hospital my insurance would cover. We'd love to hear in the comments about your experiences. Are you actually satisfied with your health care? What works for you? Let's throw it back to Michael for a quick summary from the top rope. When the government looks at these problems that the government itself created, the government says, well, we need to fix those problems. We need to intervene even more. Government intervention creating so many problems in healthcare that the government has to intervene more and more and more to try to solve the problems that it created but it's still not working. <laughs>